Um, I'm Harold Offay and uh, I live and work currently between Cambridge, London and Leeds, um, fulfilling various roles in each of those cities. So the origins of the covers project came from me looking at sort of popular cultural images. Um, I was really interested in this period in the 60s, 70s, 80s of kind of particularly within sort of black music, um, uh, sort of various artists. And I sort of just came across or re-came across, rediscovered this image of Grace Jones from her Island Life album cover. And it just sort of reminded me how I was always fascinated with that image as someone was growing up, because my mum had it, uh, the album. And um, so that really led me to really thinking about the kind of sort of cultural currency of that image and sort of just doing a bit of kind of investigation, just the kind of whole kind of catalogue of images that Grace Jones, um, in collaboration with this French art director, Jean-Paul Goud, kind of developed from the kind of late 70s onwards. And then just sort of finding out things like, you know, she studied theatre and, you know, obviously her experience as a kind of model, but on the kind of sort of disco scene in New York and all these kind of like lives that she'd sort of had and a really kind of distilled understanding of how to kind of create an image, how to construct an image um, that was sort of playful and kind of provocative. But within that, that island life image, it's sort of her in this arabesque pose um, on one leg, sort of, um, sort of semi-nude. Um, but she sort of looks like this kind of sculpture, this kind of amazing kind of Amazonian object that's sort of androgynous but sexual and kind of, you know, all the things that Grace Jones embodies and still embodies. Um, so I was really interested in that image. And I mean, quite often in, in my work as a kind of through line is this idea of really using myself as a kind of catalyst for testing cultural, uh, I guess, sort of images or frameworks or, um, uh, so I just thought it'd be really, in a way quite playfully, just thought it'd be really interesting to kind of just recreate that image. Just also partly because I found out that the image was a sort of fallacy, it's kind of constructed. Um, so it's kind of really lots of airbrushing and it's actually a composite of two images. So it's almost pretty much impossible to recreate that image because the top half is kind of, I think the lower half is completely in profile, but the top half is sort of, uh, is full on. So you'd have to kind of lose a rib or be really amazing at yoga to actually do that image. Um, so I kind of sort of wanted to kind of explore the gap between A, this image, which was, I think a lot of people would just read as like, oh, that's Grace Jones, she's in this amazing pose. And, um, the, a, the fallacy of the image, but also the kind of sort of attempt to embody the image, recreate the image as a way of interrogating its constructiveness. So I just really did it in a really kind of a pathetic way in my studio. So the actual image is of me doing the pose in a kind of domestic setting, sort of as you can see the kitchen and bathroom behind me. Um, so yeah, that was the kind of first really. And that, that really led me to really thinking about kind of album covers as kind of um, sort of cultural litmus tests, I think, sort of how kind of often, just because they're illustrative, so they're having to kind of capture um, music, so transliterate kind of music into an image or um, translate a brand or an artist's identity. Um, I think they're actually often really interesting sort of kind of a cultural genre um, that often, if you look retrospectively, actually sort of capture a particular sort of time. So I've kind of gone on to do a whole series that have kind of sort of engaged with kind of various artists. Um, so particularly people like Funkadelic, um, George Clinton, Parliament, <laughs> various, whatever, whatever he calls himself at a particular moment, I've sort of, those I've been really, really kind of fascinated with. Um, and often I think uh, after the initial few, it's been interesting how, I didn't initially realise it, but a lot of the ones that I've chosen were, had represent, were representations of women. Um, 
And um, again, for me, the almost a starting point is just like, this is a really interesting image. And then sort of trying to find out the kind of production history, the cultural history um, behind the image. Um, and then that partly sort of informed my attempt to kind of reenact it. I mean, I guess the, the catalyst really was really thinking about the photographic image and, you know, I mean, just a really kind of cliched idea of kind of sort of like the document that the kind of photograph as a kind of cultural sort of document. And, um, but I guess the strategy that I've been kind of sort of using is this sort of, sort of playing with this sort of term as like, you know, performer in research. Quite often what I do in order is I use performance as a way of, as a research tool, essentially, really. Um, and that that's for quite a long time has been quite an unconscious methodology. It's like, okay, well, uh, how do I understand? Okay, I'm gonna try it if, in order to understand it. And I think this cover series really has kind of been a more articulate, certainly from my point of view, in terms of that methodology, understanding of that process. Um, and, I mean, I guess it's a slight digression, but I've always had an interest in kind of sort of sort of performance methodologies, like sort of, you know, uh, at school, I was as much interested in theatre as I was in as it, in visual art. And um, I sort of sort of performed quite a lot. And I was really interested in like, like sort of one of my seminal references is Bert Olbrecht as a kind of sort of sort of theatre practitioner. But um I'm really thinking about this whole, like, kind of critical theatre, this idea of kind of using, so within performance, this idea of creating a relationship with the audience where they're, like, critically aware of the performance. So it's sort of not about a kind of naturalistic state where you're trying to kind of, like, you know, you know, completely merge with the character. You actually want them to be aware that this is an artifice as a kind of device. And, Again, that's something I'm, uh, again, I'm really interested in relation to responding to situations or uh, images or is that sense in which I kind of use performance as a way of kind of exploring my own understanding of kind of cultural histories or situations um, and as a way of kind of opening that out to an audience. I had a sort of formative experience at art school where um, uh, I sort of discovered, or was introduced to, I should more properly sort of say, um, you know, this whole period of the kind of sort of uh, late 60s, 70s, dematerialisation of kind of the art objects, so conceptual video performance practices. I was particularly drawn to kind of video, actually. And um, um, I mean, a whole set of a series of practitioners, I mean, usual suspects, I call them like Bruce Nauman and sort of Joan Jonas, but people like Hannah Wilkie, quite a, quite a lot of feminist artists actually. Um, uh, partly because I, I was always sort of became really interested in this idea of kind of identity and um, sort of strategies and mediums that interrogated kind of uh, identity, often quite didactically, but there was something quite drawn to that, but um, also there's kind of a sort of playfulness, I think, with the medium. You know, I think for me, like a lot of I, a lot of people see kind of sort of that kind of conceptual kind of work as being quite dry. But actually, I, just, I think a lot of it is just really hysterical. It's really funny. Like Vito Conchi is someone that I'm always kind of drawn to again and again and again. And like, I just really love like these personas that he kind of adopts within the work that are really kind of provocative and kind of playful. So like this kind of like, his like jerk persona, where he kind of plays this like asshole that sort of, but like as a really annoying character to kind of really sort of like, you know, um, really create this kind of uneasy relationship, awkwardness, which I think comes through quite a lot in his work, um, which is something I've kind of sort of always been drawn to, but, um, and to, to another extent, also just the kind of sort of sort of formalism. So like, I was also really interested in a lot of kind of, even though I didn't really necessarily make work like that, kind of like all those Vienna actionists, 
like Valley Export is someone that I really, really love and really think is amazing in terms of sort of like the creation of these images and actions. Um, Adrian Piper is totally seminal and it's sort of a bit of a benchmark that I kind of go to every couple of years, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think a lot of those strategies, I think, informed sort of, or underpin, I think, a lot of approaches um, to projects. Um, situationists, of course, not forget them. Guy de Bourg, you know, that whole kind of, um, and I kind of like that interplay of kind of sort of a, a real kind of cultural, social, political awareness um, that kind of goes beyond a, a kind of purely kind of narcissistic art for art's sake conversation. But it's also really playful and um, sort of humour as well, I think is kind of another kind of key thing that underpins. Services Rendered really sort of came about uh, really from a conversation that I had with uh, curator Selena Simmons, who invited me to take part in this show that was called At Your Service, that she was curating at the David Roberts um, Foundation. Um, uh, I mean, a slight precursor to the project, actually, was that um, I'd been doing a kind of ongoing project, which was about Hattie McDaniel. Um, and her mammy character. And the project was called Being Mammy and sort of involved me sort of again in a sort of pseudo kind of Brechtian slash method actor kind of way, taking on various elements of that kind of archetype through performance and video. Um, and initially the conversation with Selena about it's like your service show involved taking objects that I'd made so I'd made a whole series of kind of dolls and objects that kind of related to the Mammy archetype that are partly based on this archive at the University of Michigan. I think it's the it's an archive of racist memorabilia, which I just found online. Still, I've still got this resi residual wish to kind of go there. <laughs> it's like, but um, but she, she was interested in saying these objects, but I, I thought it was an opportunity really to kind of, for me to really position a strand of this Mammy project where in various situations, I, I would play Mammy in costume. And one of the rationales for it was that Mammy would always be in a service role. So at the opening of a Mammy show, Mammy would, I was thinking, well, what, what? Mammy wouldn't just be singing, standing around having champagne. She'd be doing stuff, right? Um, so like, I would sort of make this fried chicken that I found that had to have McDaniel's fried chicken must be, and she'd be serving it and kind of, um, so, I mean, the, the show that Selena was putting together was looking at the relationship of artists to service culture, whether that's artists as, as kind of in, in service to patronage or economic systems or... Um, and I really began to sort of think about kind of contemporary models of kind of sort of service um, and um, sort of proposed the idea that uh, I might do a project where I took on various service roles um, for a commission fee as a kind of performance piece specifically for the show. So we kind of had a few discussions about it and eventually kind of negotiated um, that I would do take on two roles. One was as a, as a toilet attendant um, and I've been particularly interested in this idea of the toilet attendant um, in relation to kind of service culture because I think it's sort of structurally it's really interesting in terms of its awkwardness um, particularly in a kind of British context. Um, <laughs> um, but just this idea of kind of subverting that hierarchy between the patron and the service provider. Um, so in the situations in which you encounter a toilet attendant, which is often a club or a posh restaurant, or um, the, the dynamics of the space, the lavatory, mean that often the patron is in a really awkward position, very vulnerable, you want to go to the loo, right? Um, and then you're having to kind of encounter this often unwanted service. Um, and with this idea of having to sort of pay and this awkward thing of kind of like, how do I pay this? I'm going to change on me. Um, and I just think it's really interesting sort of microcosm that 
And then the sort of layers on top of that of who fulfills these roles, so it's often new immigrants um, in various countries, it's often people who um, have been trafficked into situations um, and are then having to kind of pay, and, you know, pay back money. Um, so a whole strand that I'm currently looking at at the moment is in, is in Spain, in the Spanish resorts. You get these like performing toilet attendants, these guys um, who are generally in these jobs and they're paying off people, but they come up with songs and little kind of, so the whole space becomes quite sort of theatrical. So I was really interested in that and part of that was involved me, we were thinking of ways that we could kind of frame this. So we managed to negotiate with kind of Catherine Wood at the Tate that I would sort of do two days as a toilet attendant at Tate, kind of not really kind of announce as a performance, but I would just insert myself um, in these different spaces and sort of just fulfill the role. Um, so as a kind of precursor to that, I had to kind of go on a training day and meet some of the cleaning crew. Um, and it's interesting, the cleaning crew, mostly at Tate, Tate, at the Tate they're like Portuguese, I think mostly, or Brazilian. Um, so it was, we had a really interesting conversation. I had to talk about what I was doing in the project and, um, and then like do a kind of health and safety kind of thing. I think it was really important to me that I was actually going to be doing the job. So it was like cleaning the toilet and changing the bins and all that stuff. Um, but it is this idea of kind of inserting myself um, and the dynamics of the performance because we weren't, so a lot of the documentation we had, we had to stage before it was open because of problems with getting permissions for photographing people in that space. But um, so in some senses it was, it, it felt quite, not weird, but it felt like because the performance itself was perhaps not going to be visible. And I really like that idea of just pushing it to that extent where it was just so immersed. Uh, that it was like, it became invisible. Um, but then I, I deliberately decided to kind of do specific things in terms of, so like things like where I would stand in the space and whether or not I would address people or talk to people um, would completely shift the whole kind of interaction. Um, uh, and over the two days, only one person asked me if it was a performance. So <laughs> I don't, we, we, and, and my thing was never to be, to lie about it. I was like, always prepared, like if anybody did ask me, I would always like, so this person I had a conversation with, a quite extensive conversation about the project and what I was doing and stuff. But, um, but again, I think for me, it was really about just sort of experiencing it in order to kind of test the parameters of it. And sort of since then I've done it in various situations. So um, in Leeds a couple of years ago, I did it, I did, I was just negotiated working in a club as a toilet attendant. Um, and then I've, I've sort of done it in a more kind of theatrical kind of context. So I did a project with uh, uh, an alternative theatre cabaret group called Ducky who did a kind of big sort of kind of panto satirical kind of production where I, I did it in drag as this kind of like West African toilet attendant. So I've sort of been testing out the parameters of it and it's, it's an ongoing thing really. Uh, I, I think all of those things, aesthetics, politics, I think the, you know, this this notion of me being a kind of uh, a researcher, uh, I think, and I think for me this idea of kind of just using myself as a kind of a conduit for kind of my own self-learning, I think, you know, in terms of my own practice, I'm just really interested in asking kind of questions, really basic questions, and, you know, that I'm sort of interested in finding out about. And I think I use the practice as a way of negotiating how I might share that with other people. Um, and, um, but I think, you know, the wider politics and the social cultural resonances are really, really important to me. I mean, I'm, 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 I think, I don't really see a kind of division between the two, you know? Um, and, you know, like, sort of, 
you know, that feminist mantra, the, you know, the personal is pol political, is kind of, I, I, I kind of, it suffuses every aspect, you know, I, I find it very difficult to kind of sort of set aside, you know, oh, well, that exists over here, and, you know. Although in terms of making the work, often the imperative is just kind of aesthetic, it's formal, it's kind of like, or material, it's like, well, this is, I'm sort of drawn to this, this is kind of, or I want to make this, or I want to kind of explore how this is made. Um, but um, I think I'm always aware that, that all those things are kind of positioned and they exist within a particular kind of sort of framework, really. Um, so, and, and they're, they're another layer of kind of material as well. I think it's really important to kind of like, sort of really kind of sort of tap into that and really have, hopefully have a level of critical awareness that, um, to say that these things are kind of mediated by external forces. It's, you know, it's not purely about, you know, um, a visual aesthetic kind of uh, material interest, you know, um, which I think, was, I don't know, there's a level of, you know, I think uh, for me, art practice is always a kind of mixture between, you know, knowing and unknowing and naivety and uh, understanding and it kind of oscillates between the two and there are moments where the naivety affords you a degree of kind of like um, momentum to do stuff. Like often when I'm in moments of stasis, it's because I'm thinking about it too much in terms of like you're overburdening the work with a kind of level of kind of critical thinking that's just like, you know, which is like, it doesn't allow you to do anything. Um, so I think you do need a certain amount of naivety, but I think it has to, you know, if you're going to put stuff out there, you just, it's just like, I don't know. I think, again, this is, I'm a product of my sort of training and that sort of my training has been that sort of classic sort of post 70s kind of, you know, cri critical theory, post-structuralist kind of, you know, deconstructionist kind of like mode. Um, yeah, I think sort of. I think humour has been a really kind of key driver in terms of the production of the work. Um, I think because a lot of my interests, like I said, formative interests were in this kind of conceptual video art, performance art kind of sort of narrative. Um, I was always really interested in how they use kind of sort of humour um, and um, particularly in relation to something like sort of video. So it just practically it sort of came back by really thinking about this idea of um, how do you kind of engage an audience in relation to specific mediums, you know. Um, and it seemed like to me in relation to the kind of where I was making work initially in the 90s, this idea of a, that 70s moment of really like durational works, like watching these like, you know, amazing kind of like v Vienna actionists or Abramovich kind of pieces where they're just like going for hours or days or whatever. That was a deliberate provocation that was antagonizing, being anti-commercialist or anti-market. Um, and it felt like me sort of looking at the models of the legacy of that, of things like that within kind of popular culture was you know, you know, things like kind of MTV, um, in terms of kind of video culture, um, and actually really sort of saying, I, I don't want to necessarily alienate an audience or, or there are other strategies of kind of like engaging an audience um, beyond just kind of sort of a blank duration. Um, and for me, humour is really kind of, a key strategy in that and, and sort of within that devices within humour, so satire and absurdity. Um, uh, and I think for me that I've sort of really been acutely aware of that in relation to various mediums and forms that I've kind of used. It's kind of, um, and maybe it, again, it goes back to kind of sort of Brecht in that, you know, like a lot of his early like performance work is quite didactic works. Um, 
he was sort of going around like these German factories, sort of trying to kind of like inculcate these factory workers into like socialist parties and union movements. So like these lunchtime performances where they'd have to kind of communicate a kind of story, but you've got all these workers that are doing like eight hour, nine hour shifts. How do you kind of get them, how do you get the message out there? So he was like, you know, I mean, bourgeois theatre is not going to work in that context. You've got to use music, you've got to have comedy, it's got to be short skits, you know. Um, I think, that, again, that, that's I've sort of been kind of conscious of, okay, sort of time frames and cultural references and that idea of how humour can kind of lull people in. Awkwardness as a kind of really sort of that tension between when, when something that moment when some it sits in between a kind of like, how long is this gonna go on for? Or this is, I don't really feel comfortable with this. And, and then laughter becomes an uncomfortable manifestation of embarrassment or something. So, yeah. Transporters sort of, uh, as a work, is a commission from Art on the Underground. Um, and it's sort of um, a series of commissions that they've kind of launched this year, uh, 2014, as part of the 100th, 150th anniversary of the London Underground. Um, so there have been various kind of commissions, really, to kind of commemorate that. Um, and sort of transporter... Um, so I was asked to kind of submit a proposal, really, in relation to um, the Underground and uh, a key project for the anniversary, which has been a Mark Wallinger project, which is called Labyrinth, um, where he's kind of created these like labyrinth mazes for each of the 270 odd stations, um, so unique ones. Um, so really, really thinking about the underground network as this kind of sort of um, labyrinth, which is different to a maze. <laughs> this is the one thing that I, I kind of discovered from this project. So with a labyrinth, you can always find your way out which I think is like, hopefully a good metaphor for the underground. But um, So I was asked to kind of propose a project really that might uh, kind of really think about the underground as a kind of sort of site in relation to two youth groups in northwest London. Um, one um, is an activity centre, a water sports activity centre. Um, um, and the other one is a is a, a youth centre for Somali youths. Um, and these two organisations kind of exist in sort of around the kind of Labrick Grove area, but haven't had really much interaction between the two organisations. Um, so my starting point really for thinking about it was A, thinking about my relationship with the underground and um, really thinking about how I sort of might map that. Um, uh, but also really thinking about, uh, I mean, it was, and again, this sort of project sort of plugs into a whole series of things that I've been doing that have been looking at a kind of sort of um, Afro-futurist kind of sort of legacy and the kind of currency of things around that or people's engagement with this notion of, you know, post-Sun Ra uh, um, ideas. Um, but really thinking about, I began to really think about the underground as this kind of like sort of retro futurist space. So this idea of it having a kind of utopian underpinning. So if you go back, particularly this moment in the 20s and 30s, like the whole underground was promoted as a kind of emancipatory kind of space that would take people from the suburbs or from slums and allow them to navigate the city. Thinking about it as this kind of sort of, you know, formerly black holes that you disappear into and then appear in different locations. So that became a starting point for these conversations with the young people really, was to think about how can we think about it as a kind of futuristic space? What was their relationship with it? Um, and then really thinking about it in relation to the future. And for me, my interest in kind of sort of sci-fi and Afrofuturism is a kind of sort of, as a kind of sort of cultural moment is actually, I think, sort of sci-fi is always a really useful device in capturing uh, the present. So if you look at kind of sort of, you know, 
sort of Russian constructivists in the 20s and 30s, their vision of sci-fi completely embodies that moment of kind of the Soviet utopian project. Similarly, in the 60s and 70s, and I think, you know, for me, that whole kind of culture of Afrofuturism as captured in these periods is just a really great microcosm of those debates. Um, so, I mean, I often use it as a device in relation to kind of sort of groups that I kind of work with. It's like, well, let's think about the future. What, what, what do you imagine in the future? Um, and it's great, you know, um, the project involved kind of creating these kind of like visual panels that would line the escalators at Bethnal Green and uh, Notting Hill Gate Station. So two points east-west of kind of sort of London. Um, and I asked them to really think about like the stations between those two points and what they might look like in 150 years time. Really think about kind of the visual culture of kind of sort of sci-fi and what they'd kind of appropriate. Um, and it's just really fantastic. I mean, for me, it's really that kind of really putting myself in a situation where um, I ask a question and that question is kind of sort of filtered through other people's responses is really, really important. Um, and what was really interesting from that project was just how they mirrored back some really interesting things about the moment. So like, you know, lots of them kind of incorporated this idea of like CCTV. So like this idea of like cameras that would read people's identity and would somehow sort of like, um, you know, this idea of security, um, sort of like developing these like barriers or finger readers and kind of just, the, in, uh, stuff to me that was really, really sinister and like, oh my, you know, to them they kind of really just kind of embraced as kind of like, these are just kind of sort of tools. So, it's kind of, um, so yeah, and, and, and again, sort of part of that project was really nice. We did some really interesting things in terms of really thinking about that kind of public space. And um, so as part of the project, we developed all these um, announcements. So like futuristic, um, kind of tannoy announcements so which which you know the young people kind of wrote and and we sort of somehow negotiated it to be played intermittently i have to say but in the station so every now and again you'll hear like a nine-year-old like sort of you know you know beware of um you know mind the gap because there's a black hole and you might fall into kind of, you know so for me that was also really important and that was something that just came out of you know them interacting with the space. It's been sort of difficult to kind of map that really, because I've had anecdotal kind of, because when we launched the project, they did a, sort of, they made like a little film and kind of interviewed people, but it's more been through people that I know have sort of said they've seen it. But I, I don't really know, it's really difficult to kind of get a sense of how people kind of respond. I mean, we spent a long time really thinking about the idea that the work might be there for a year. And, you know, if you go through Bethnal Green Station every day, you know, how, how would people kind of deal with something that you see every day? So that, so I think the young people deliberately, this idea of having a work that had lots of content and lots of little hidden things so that you might see something different in it every time you went through the space. They were conscious of that. Um, I don't know, I, I, I think over a number of years really I've been sort of looking at the relationship between projects that have involved various uh, community groups or, you know, specific audiences that I've kind of sort of worked with in relation to kind of other strategies that I've kind of employed really. And I think I've just sort of come to the conclusion that it's all a spectrum, it's all part of the same thing. I, I you know, I think for a lot of artists there's a kind of division between things so this is this gallery work is the work and then this stuff is kind of adjunct and you know it's partly about engaging with a specific audience but it's also about making money and support. I mean all those things are true but I, I think um I think a, as an artist I think um f for me it's kind of you know this idea that as an artist you'll you know, the repository of an artwork is not only the gallery. I think 
there are different spaces and situations in which, you know, your agency as an artist kind of uh, can exist. Um, so for me, this idea of an artist is a kind of very open term. And I think all of those situations are, um, I consider as artwork, legitimate artwork, sometimes more interesting, actually, when I look back, I kind of think, well, um, I think there's, there are hierarchies, obviously, within the, the art world about what is kind of more legitimate or what is given more um, space for discourse and discussion, certainly. Um, and also notions of authorship as well, you know, I think. But then I, I've never been someone that's particularly been attached to kind of like... Because um, if you look at the... I mean, this is something I've been looking at in recent years is that kind of sort of division between within, you know, a kind of sort of gallery institute context, that notion of artists working relationally or in a socially engaged kind of sort of way. Um, there's that mode of practice. And then artists kind of sort of working in, I guess, a kind of gallery education kind of community kind of context. And the main difference is authorship. It's this idea that in one, there's this notion that the artist is in somehow service and is facilitating and the key aim is the kind of sort of process and um, the benefit to the audience um, in that biennale kind of sort of in institutional kind of sort of framework it's very much about still the artist's authorship so you know um, Thomas Hershorn or you know all these other people that I could kind of name but um, it's still very much their work you know and it's very kind of sort of framed within that and um, you get the sense in which those participants are material within that work you know they somehow constitute the work but they are kind of material um, and you know while I find a lot of that interesting and I think is really you know and, and, and there have been situations where I've worked in that mode um, for me it's actually really interesting to be in a situation where you are in service it is purely about facilitating and it's your authorship is contentious and it's all you're you know you're devolving your authorship actually for me that's really interesting I mean in the same way that I see kind of sort of teaching and working in a university art school kind of context I think that's also another space for artistic practice um, and actually Often those spaces are far more challenging to me as an artist because my authorship is contested. It is sort of, I do have to sort of say, well, what am I doing here? And how am I, how am I kind of addressing these issues? And what are the politics of the dynamics between me and the audience? Um, so for me, it's really, really important. It's really, really useful to kind of engage in that. I think what I'm sort of fighting a bit more now is to try and make that more visible and be more aware of a kind of discourse that kind of supports that so I can articulate that a bit more I think. Definitely, definitely and I think you know for me this is something I was kind of aware of really just you know because you know like, I think like quite a lot of like um, BME artists like I was sort of approached to kind of do sort of projects with community groups and and sort of sort of initially naively quite enthusiastic about kind of getting involved and, and doing stuff. And then it reached a point I was just kind of thinking, well, you know, just strategically, it's like, you know, there, you know, there is a kind of sort of uh, a sort of through line with this that leads you in a particular direction that will shape your kind of career. Um, and I just kind of felt that I had to really just be a bit more critically aware of my relationship to that in relation to a strategy. Because I know a lot of artists who will have nothing to do with that. It's just like, you know, I ain't going down that path. That's kind of, you know. Um, but for me, I felt there was a moment where I kind of thought, no, actually, this is important to me. This is a really, I think, in terms of my own experience, in relation to kind of sort of culture and education, I think it's really important that um, that there is some kind of sort of dialogue. I'm also, I guess also as well, I think, you know, 
I really do see myself as a kind of sort of social agent as well. Like, I know like lots of people have talked about the idea of kind of artists in that role as being sort of cheap social workers or kind of people. But I think it, for me, it's very difficult to kind of divorce that kind of sort of, um, you know, divorce myself as an artist from a wider social context. And I think if I can sort of add something to a kind of conversation through a dialogue um i think that's also really important uh, but but also in a very selfish way what i've really what i'm sort of trying to articulate as well is that sort of learning and gallery education is an opportunity that affords artists learning and i think that's really really important that's something i think that's a whole area that's not really articulated very well and the most there's some really innovative sort of programming um, and um, outcomes that come out of projects. Um, but the way often that sector is kind of framed is obviously through the audience's learning. But actually, I think for me, what, and the thing that's always kind of kept me embedded within that area, is this idea of it affords artist learning. And actually, it's a really, really challenging um, that, you know, to kind of, how do I communicate what I do to an audience that doesn't have an experience of kind of art or like, you know, I feel it's important that, you know, that I engage with that. I don't think all artists have to do that. And I certainly have a problem with an expectation for BME artists to somehow have the burden of having to do that. You know, often when that isn't, you know, an expectation of just artists generally, you know. It's kind of like, you know, I often find it's interesting that there aren't many painters often that are kind of like doing this. It's particular kind of people that are working in particular ways often. Um, so, yeah, I think that expectation more broadly is a, is a problem, I think. But personally, for me, I think it's really, really important. Um, I think my first encounter with Post Black... Um, Funnily enough, was in New York at its spiritual home, the Studio Museum in Harlem. So um, I was at the Royal College at the time, and we went on a, like a, a sort of field trip to New York, and um, I sort of um, sort of made a pilgrimage to the Studio Museum in Harlem, and um, they they had the freestyle kind of catalogue, and I saw the term. I was flicking through it, and I eventually kind of bought it, and sort of. So that was my first kind of encounter with it in relation to that kind of show, which had been several years before 2000. But um, I sort of didn't really kind of understand. Um, uh, but I thought what was interesting was thinking about it in relation to the works, so the works in that show and what they were kind of articulating and being introduced to um, a kind of a generation of artists that I hadn't ever heard of. Um, uh, so f for me that really became a kind of sort of key point really and really thinking through some of those works and then going on to just research some of these artists who somehow became associated I mean of often you know through you know Thelma Golden and programming at Studio Museum in Harlem and you know that very coherent agenda that she kind of put forward um, so you know, I think in terms of my understanding of it, um, you know, it was this sense in which there's this kind of sort of uh, moment, particularly in a very African-American context, uh, where artists are beginning to kind of work outside of the kind of sort of constricting framework of blackness, notions of blackness. I mean, the problem with, I think, that the whole sort of project is that you know, or the whole term is that it's so, A, what is blackness? What, what does that mean anyway, in terms of a sense of post-blackness? What are the frames of reference for that? Um, but it's certainly, I think, this idea of kind of artists trying to kind of deal with burdens of representation, um, cultural expectations um, from within black communities and externally. Um, and I think, sort of this notion of kind of sort of um, this generation of, of artists being um, more kind of suffused within 
sort of wider discourses and cultural frameworks of their own choosing that go beyond purely kind of race. Um, which I think for me just in some ways seem pretty obvious in terms of kind of, you know, what what people do. I think, you know, as artists, you you just, you know, you just are yourself and you're just into what you're into, you know. Um, it's only when you encounter these kind of canonical things that you start and it's like, oh, I, I'm that, well, that's me, how do I deal with that? But I think the, the useful thing about it was that it did uh, force me to kind of question, A, what blackness was, and then the sense in which post-blackness might position itself in relation to, to that, those other terms. So. Um, I think, again, I think that's a really useful question to really think about post-blackness and sort of British histories and British kind of sort of legacies. Um, I, I feel it's something that's never been a, a conversation. I don't think I've really had a conversation where it's kind of sort of focused on the kind of UK kind of like situation. Like I've had conversations about post-black and post-racial, but it's always been in a kind of very American kind of sort of framework uh, and talking about American artists in relation to that. Um, uh, I mean, I think, you know, certainly in terms of the kind of history and trajectory of kind of sort of um, artists and artist movements, um, I mean, I've sort of been aware, you know, and I've sort of had an influence by that sort of generation of artists from the 80s, you know, Sonia Boyce, Keith Piper, um, and the kind of discourses around, you know, what was known as a black art movement. Um, but I think what's interesting is that, you know, unlike America, I think there's never been a post-generation that's been articulated in that way, you know. So if I think about the kind of sort of, you know, the next wave of artists, like, Chris Affili, Steve McQueen, they were never really, you know, like, you know, I can't think of one show where they were in together, maybe there probably was one, but like, or certainly that was kind of marketed as that. Um, so there's never been the sense of a kind of, uh, a movement of artists that has been post that black arts generation movement because the American experience is very different to that. And, but actually, a lot of artists that have come out of this, you know, this kind of post-blackness agenda have been incredibly successful internationally, have been able to operate outside of that in kind of sort of different contexts within sort of various biennales and, you know, that aren't beholden to that notion of kind of the sort of black experience. Um, I think in the sense that, you know, um, I've sort of really tried in my work, I guess, is, is this sense in which that, um, uh, I guess, I mean, I, I'm sort of interested in notions of representation and, uh, um, how, uh, those are representations are kind of constructed through culture, media, politics, society. Um, and, but I'm still wedded to this idea that that can be articulated through a black experience, my experience. Um, so, I, so I'm always in a bit of a kind of oscillation between this idea of kind of like, because I'm always dealing with this idea of the burden of representation, because I think a strategy I think that's sort of come post-blackness, I've seen by some artists is, is that the black body gets removed. It sort of becomes invisible. Um, and, uh, part, and it seemed to me that seemed to be a way of kind of like sidestepping this idea of the burden of representation as well. Well, I just get rid of that and I use other things. Um, which is sort of fine, but I've, I've always kind of, you know, I, I don't know, I've kind of got this 
this personal project, which I sort of call the black universal, which is, you know, this idea that, and, and I think that's partly articulated in some aspects of um, post-blackness, is this idea of the black experience being a kind of universal. And I think, you know, if you look at kind of hip hop, you know, the most economically successful genre of music today, um, it's actually, that, that doesn't necessarily even now, wholly is not contained by a black experience, you know. I was in China a few years ago in like um, um, Guangzhou and I got taken to like a hip hop club, you know, and there are all these like Chinese kids that are just like, you know, were like rapping and it was like an open mic night. And I was like, what is this? Um, but it's actually really amazing because it, they'd really embraced this idea of a kind of urban experience. And that again is an interesting term, but um, in relation to blackness anyway. Um, but, you know, and it really kind of claimed that, you know, and I think, I mean, that's, this is not maybe the first time that's happened, you know, in terms of, I think hip hop is a kind of good example of that because it, it exists in, 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 within a global context. Yeah, I think it's important for artists to define their work beyond those boundaries of kind of blackness and I guess a kind of racial identity. Um, and I think there are examples of artists that are kind of sort of doing that. I mean, I think within my own work, I'm in a slightly different position in that I'm still interested in those questions. And um, um, so, and, you know, also as well in terms of the work, you know, I think it's important that um, that experience is kind of conveyed, but, but it's just, because it's just my experience, I'm not necessarily, you know, it's that thing of like, I think the dilemma that a lot of artists kind of face, which is that, you know, if in the kind of sort of telling or communication of your own experience, um, you know, you have to kind of negotiate these strategies and these questions around representation. And um, uh, so, you know, the, the kind of the forms in which you choose become kind of key um, and the strategies in which you choose become kind of, kind of key. Um, but, uh, you know, I do, think it's, I do think it's important that, you know, that there are sort of, I think, really interesting people that are kind of operating that are able to kind of um, do that without being kind of constrained. Um, you know, people like Anthea Hamilton, I think. Um, I mean, I think I'm talking about like, this is British, more British kind of context, but like someone like Damien Roach, I think is a really interesting artist, but, um, uh, but his work isn't framed by a kind of sort of um, racial blackness, post-black. I don't know whether he'd even like engage with any of those kind of sort of terms, really. Um, and I think also what's quite interesting about maybe even b both of those artists actually is they're really successful in continental Europe um, in terms of their sort of practice and sort of someone like Damien has really has been done really well in Germany and it's kind of really kind of, probably more so than here, actually. Um, which again, maybe might be indicative of things. I think the global contemporary is kind of, um, you know, as, as a kind of sort of term within kind of contemporary art, you know, has been something that's kind of sort of, I guess I first encountered through uh, Ekwon Wazel's Documenta, um, you know, as a kind of, which uh, at the time I was sort of quite young going to that show, I think it was my first Documenta, and sort of struck by this kind of, you know, this huge scale sort of project really, that I think really fantastically kind of articulated um, um, this idea of kind of a global diverse narrative of artwork and, and cultural production that was kind of sort of happening. Um, 
And I think, you know, for me anyway, that seemed to have kind of sort of set the agenda really for kind of like the cultural politics of institutions since then in terms of, you know, um, you know, acquisition policies, in terms of curatorial policies, um, that that sort of dialogue that was established, that sense in which um, particularly public institutions had an obligation to go beyond Europe and North America in terms of, um, I don't know, presenting a kind of um, a perspective, communicating practice. Um, and I think I, as a practitioner, um, as a cultural consumer, I just benefited really from the opening out of discourse to look at, you know, Asia, the Middle East, Latin America, Africa, um, in relation to kind of kind of historical, but also kind of contemporary works, you know. And I, I think, um, in terms of my practice, that's been really, really kind of important in terms of intersecting with these kind of sort of global narratives. I mean, I think there are some interesting things in relation to the market, how that's now so proliferation of biennials and art fairs, um, this notion of a kind of sort of curatorial people flying into Mumbai to find, well, you know, I want to find a new artist who's in Mumbai or flying into, you know, I don't know, you know, Senegal or Brazil or Argentina to kind of like sniff out these new people. There's that kind of sort of art safari kind of tourism kind of thing that sort of, I think, maybe sort of has also been another legacy of that. And I think there are institutional kind of problematic things with that. But um, I think personally, I, th I personally really benefited just from access to kind of particularly historical kind of works. Yeah, I mean, f for me, um, sort of partly coming out of uh, a residency that I did with Gasworks in uh, 2003 um, to Rio, to Brazil, kind of um, spending three months in Rio and just like, you know, discovering Elio Ochocica and um, Legia Clark, Legia Pape, you know, kind of. And, but also kind of, you know, this other generation of kind of um, Brazilian artists, more contemporary kind of artists, you know, um, uh, was just really great. You know, in fact, that there was this whole kind of legacy, alternative kind of modernist legacy, um, Afro-Brazilian legacy kind of like narratives that I've just, you know, just wasn't even, like don't even ever remember seeing a book about like Brazilian art before. 2003, but um, so for me, I think that, and actually it, what was also really interesting was how actually a lot of that work was kind of, you know, you know, was sort of relational before relational aesthetics. It was kind of like, you know, so, so, so this idea that, you know, that sort of these artists had actually sort of really been sort of like, plugged into kind of a sort of wider discourse, you know. I don't know, I mean, maybe that, you know, I, I think it's also interesting talking to a lot of those artists within the context of somewhere like Brazil, I feel a little bit sort of patronised, really, by this idea of, like, being discovered, you know, and it's just like those kind of colonial narratives, kind of like, you know, inversely, people kind of replicating these kind of colonial narratives, even within a kind of post-colonial context, it's interesting how we kind of sort of fall into those kind of sort of traps of kind of, you know. I think, you know, this notion of a kind of global curator, the uber curator, the, um, and that notion of kind of curatorial authorship, I think is something that I've sort of kind of been aware of it. I mean, I think I don't, I don't have a position that is, I'm not anti that. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's thrown up some really interesting 
conversations and dialogues that have been really useful in kind of sort of shaping sort of practice. I mean, I think there's a residual resentment maybe, I think, amongst artists about this notion of kind of authorship and um, an authorial kind of sort of stamp um, and the idea that kind of sort of, you know, artist work becomes kind of instrumentalised within this kind of meta-narrative of some uber curator. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I think... I think that, you know, that, that kind of has its place. I mean, I have sort of certain problems with there's a kind of sort of orthodoxy that kind of goes up around certain people. So you get devotees or schools of, you know, these people that kind of sort of, I find that more kind of sort of problematic, really. Um, but, um, I mean, I think you know, in relation to my own experience, because I mean, I think the thing is artists have always kind of curated, have always kind of sort of, you know, through collective and self-interest kind of um, created kind of platforms for uh, their own work and other artists' work. And I think that that is just an intrinsic part of what artists do, you know. Um, um, and, you know, when I have sort of engaged with that, for me, again, it's been about a way of um, creating dialogues with other artists or with other artists' work. Or, I mean, I call what I do selecting more than curating. Because I think, for me, that aspect of actually kind of looking and a kind of sort of the editorial kind of decision-making process where I'm thinking, OK, that's interesting. What happens if I put that together and sort of, I mean... I don't necessarily start with a kind of curatorial framework or an agenda. Um, but I think, what, I think what's been good is that this idea that kind of, you know, there is a look at kind of curatorial practice. I think what's been more influential actually has been uh, curatorial courses in terms of how that's really shaped the art world, particularly for younger artists. Because, you know, there are these sort of programmes that are churning out these amazing, like, young, hungry curators, you know. Because I remember sort of, like, in the 90s, when I was like, you know, you'd come out of art school and you'd sort of negotiate stuff by putting on shows together. And there used to be, like, artist-run spaces, you know. Um, you know, and people would put on ag an ad hoc things. And... There is that to a certain extent now, but actually people are far more knowing. So like, you know, you get all these like young people, I sound like an old fogey, but these young people that are slash things. So I'm like an artist slash curator slash writer slash cult cultural critic slash DJ, you know. Um, but certainly these young curators, I think, often because they're trying to find a voice, a curatorial voice, are often the ones that are providing the platforms uh, for young artists. So they're kind of going out there and saying, oh, what you do? oh let's, let's do something, or being cultural agents, or, or even within institutions, I think, you know, kind of like sort of, you know, being angry young kids and sort of saying, we should be doing this, we should do I think that's good, you know, I think, you know, there's, um, I think the challenge is for young artists to kind of like, you know, and I think they are doing it to a certain extent, is to say, you know, are you a sort of person that's going to just wait and hook hook into a young curator and kind of, you know, use that as a kind of platform? Or are you going to take control in some agency and do that yourself? And I, I think there's a proliferation now of strategies for for young artists in terms of where, where do they go? And I mean, I find it interesting sort of teaching on a BA Fine Art course, you know, I've got first years that are like, I want to be a curator. It's like, I'm doing this fine art course to be a curator. And that, with a stated ambition of that as a creative practice and they're curating their cohorts work immediately, like first term, they're doing it. Are they seeing it as a form of art practice or are they seeing it as a kind of task? As a it's, way of getting on in the art world? It's a good question, because there's a spectrum um, or, um, which I find really, like, really shocking as well, because I'm like, really? There are some of them that are really, um, 
already really thinking about it as a kind of institutional kind of like way of shaping and authoring um, and you can see they already have an a, agenda to kind of like you know because they're I've got a few students that already now are working with um, interning with art organisations in Leeds where I work which is a really smart thing to do in terms of you know using university as a kind of platform for that but then there are others that I think are more see it as part of practice you know and it's a more kind of collegiate thing um, where they're kind of working in collaboration with there's like a small group of them and there's a dialogue around the work and finding situations and locations to place the work and really thinking about um, a discourse around the work so writing around the work um, creating publications, online platforms, all of that stuff.